Ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, or even if I may not have your attention, I'll ask for it anyway in a polite way. What? I was told that I, I speak too quickly and that I should slow down, especially when I do this, so I'm going to do that. Hello, <laughs> everybody, and welcome to Sacred Ground. Give yourself a round of applause for being here. This is not for me, this is for you, and also the people who are listening in that are evening shall remain nameless. Fine poetry and good food since 1972. So called the longest running open poetry mic that we know of in the known and unknown universe. We have a Facebook page and then we also stream live. That address is a little obsolete, but you can still find us. And if there's problems, you can see me and I will direct you correctly. Tonight's feature we have the Hate Ashbury Literary Arts Journal. So there's several people who are involved with that. So I hear this is here. So give them a round of applause. I mean, they've been around, it's been around for like 40 years or something. 1980, since 1980, and I, I was doing some research on the web, one of the links that I posted was uh, a link uh, was linked to a story of who started, when it happened, where, where, what house, and all this stuff, and all these things, it was very interesting. So if you look at the Facebook page, or you saw the email list, that link is there. Um, let me just go here and say, um, never say um when you're on a mic because um, it's not um, good. Um, uh, the keynote is Karen Huff. Give her a nice small round of applause here. Where is she? She's, oh, there she is. Oh, don't get up yet. I'm going to my ass. I just want to let it out so we got there. And then, of course, for our mini feature of the evening, the esteemable David Erdogan, who is going to be giving us a nice set of poems at the end of the evening. It looks like at the end of the evening. There might be people coming in after him. We shall see. Uh, Mr. Natural sets up the streaming, and this is the light condom, which... <laughs> uh, allows you to look uh, somewhat 
or pleasant when you're actually being clean. Now it'll be up, uh, seen. If you have a cell phone, which I know I do, now's the time to take it and see to it that it will not ring during the course of this wonderful evening. Because if it does, then you'll be embarrassed because you say, oh, Dan already told me. Everybody will look at you and give you the eye. Now, usually I introduce the fabulous prizes, but I, I, I'm, go, I'm going to set them out so at the time we have the break, you'll be able to see them. But there's one that I will indicate to you. Uh, the major English romantic poets. They notice they didn't say top sergeant or lieutenant, they said major. Uh, so this is Coleridge, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, and Keats, and amongst others, as you can see. It's a redolent book. A lot of that word. Uh, Joan Didion? Didion. 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 So that's another one that Sacramento, I just... Sacramento, 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 uh, uh, writer. So a couple of those, and of course, one of the other ones is being the keynote, which you'll see this evening, and the mini feature, which you'll see this evening. Those are also door prizes. The uh, Poets One Page Calendar, which is actually two pages, but it's on one page, so it's called the one page. You two sides. Wait a minute. Now you can see. Voila. Those will be here. And if you want to get the emails for this place, you put your name clearly written and your email clearly written so that I can put you on the list. They send out, I only send out one thing a week, pretty much. So that takes care of those announcements. One last thing, if you read a poem by someone else, you put your name, the poet's name, and the name of the poem. So when I do the write-up, I won't, like I say, say Char Charge of the Light Brigade by Chalky Chaucer, who never wrote that. But anyway, so those are the main announcements. I think is there anything? Oh, yes, our hosts, Fiona and Teddy, they are the people who have made this place available for us. And who, despite logic, reason, rationale, and profitability, continue to support us in the ways that we decided to become a customer. So, let me just sit down here and see who is on first, what's on second. Karen Huff is the mini, is the, uh, will provide the keynote, and I will, she knows how to take care of the mic. Give her a nice round. Now, the keynote person comes back during the open because the keynote is your opportunity to read a piece of poetry that you feel is really way rad cool, as the kids used to say 15 years ago when I knew what the kids used to say. <laughs> so, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I will enjoy it. Okay, so what I've got tonight is work by Lauren Isley. He's better known as one of the leading anthropologists and paleontologists of the last century. But he was also a very magical poet and somebody who influenced me a lot 30 years ago. This is called In a Red Sunset on Another Hill. Ours is a trap that ages follow and reject. In a red sunset on another hill, I joined them long ago. I saw them first in pictures and old books, among dried alligator skins, curled ammonites, perched cuttlefish, or fossils much misunderstood. They were not charlatans, not scientists, alchemists of the heart, perhaps. They loved these things. They loved the queer twist of a no wolf's head, stag beetle's horns, a white owl from some tundra flown astray. Trash, trash was what they gathered. Wives despaired if they had wives and flung it all away. Their scrying crystals moldered in locked chests. They never read the times correctly then, and least of all their death. Worm-eaten books surround them, sharks' teeth and stuffed mermaids. The cult is old and new as yesterday. I found once in a hidden place, so lost I knew that only Indians had sheltered there. The teeth of Oya done, a square iron nail, heaped in a low crevice covered by a stone nearby. Faint signs of an encampment, all were gone. Only the shaman and the bearded skin, only the seeker for the times beyond, 
had gathered these and gone his way alone into the falling night. With puzzled hands, I too, a youthful digger, felt for them, and touched by courtesies of an old trade, went my own way and left them, though I knew not in this century would they ever be back. Since then I meet such men quite readily. Some practice science, like me, are not scientists, wear a disguise best fitted for the times, walk close, walk wary. The peak cap with stars no longer suitable. We sit before a microscope or watch the Pleiades, but we belong to an old crowd. Wizards who loved the living world, loved mystery, kept talking birds close to their shoulders, never solved a thing, but lived lives close to where the solutions were, and did not want them, preferred mystery. I know my origins from that bad land void of hidden fossils, was taught by one who cast runes by the burnt bone of the hair, believed prophetic dreams, and held a proud, world-shaking name in science, but knew voodoo dress and spells. Forever after I have wandered cities and seas, picked up coiled nautilus, namely. And to me, impulsive strangers have each given bear's teeth, curved masks, the floating heads of things the roving Iroquois saw in the woods two centuries back. These things accumulate, a beaver's skull, a mastodon's black tooth out of the glacial bog. Why must I hold such fetishes in trust as though to be reclaimed? Science has probed as far as it may get into their ways. Long, long ago I realize it now. I joined another crowd in the red sunset on a badland hill in the wild company of a man who sat down in the dust with savages and turtles. I know only the mystery of objects, save what I can keep from being ground to dust. I cannot bring the beaver back alive. I cannot, from a glacier frozen tooth, restore the mastodon. Ravens may talk upon my shoulders all in vain, and students hear not. I am bound to those who, when the great herds ebbed away, in polychrome, sketched on cave walls, shapes never to be seen, half man, half beast. Yes, I walk mad, would have strange things aligned in my own burial vault, but dare not say it. Yes, I belong to that most ancient brotherhood, not often named, because we once were stoned, or burned, or hanged or now suffer the ostracism of the seeming looms. We are not entirely welcome among men. See in the dark, wait for the ice. I think, far off, our arts may well be practiced once again. Thank you so much, Kevin. Wow, beautiful work. Thank you. I'll show you back at the open as, as is, is the tradition from the uh, you do. Uh, I'm going to read the first five or six readers so everybody knows where they are. George Leroy Tirebiter, <laughs> Mark Time, Lauren, can't be that. Are they here? Yeah, right. So uh, then the next set we'll get really close to. We have Bobby Coleman, Dan Langton, Karen Huff, Buford, then Owen, then Louis. So Mr. Coleman might be helping us out later on with the feature, and that remains to be seen because plants are a little bit on the flexible side. Which is fine by me. So give Mr. Coleman a nice warm First, my compliments to the Haight Ashbury Literary yes, Service. It's a wonderful issue. I uh, heard the readings earlier in the month. And it's always good, and we support the journal, but this is an exceptional issue. It's really terrific.
that's all you can do. Alright, that's good. Alright, thank you. Uh, this is very brief. San Francisco eviction haiku. Fall on Fillmore Street. A Google bus jumps the curb. Gathering tribes. Gone. Fall on Fillmore Street. A Google bus jumps the curb. Gathering tribes. Gone. New leaves evicted. Companies cruise in leaking boats. Dry season lingers. New leaves evicted. Companies cruise in leaking boats. Dry season lingers. Birds arrive in spring. High buildings where they had nests. Heavy wings still search. Birds arrive in spring. High buildings where they had nests. Heavy wings still search. That's San Francisco fiction haiku. Could you, oh, sorry, could you read the first one again? Because I was going to try to tell you to read the haiku twice, and you weren't doing that, and I couldn't do that first one. So, sorry. Fall on Fillmore Street. A Google bus jumps the curb. Gathering tribes. Gone. What I like to do with haiku is people read it twice because sometimes that really helps. It's wonderful. And hit, and hit them over the head. Huh? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. And now uh, we have a special guest, someone that taught me uh, a good measure about poetry all these years ago. Mr. Dan Langton, if you kindly come forward, please, and take the mic. Give him a nice round of applause. I scorn people who use rare words in poems. Who wants to read poetry in a dictionary? Anymore? But in this next poem, there's a word I thought was common. It's from music, and a musician friend told me he didn't know what it meant. Huh. So a threnody is a song of lamentation. It was last December 31st. I was sitting in the kitchen listening to music on the radio. When the music stopped, and a man came on and read the names of every artist, poet, novelist, entertainer who had died last year. And of course I was depressed. They put the music back on. But a poem came from me. Poem is called The Music. know who's dying, not who's being born. A boy who kills his mother as he's torn from her will redeem the world. A dancer we can tell from the dance. An answer we have dearly sought will come from a girl in Uzbekistan. A flag on the throw. The American Mozart will give us a friend, a hint of Lincoln or of Kennedy. 
Tonight, so many look into the past, the dusk, the useless rooms, the die they cast, to, te to see that time when they will be alone, when they will put the stone upon the stone. They should be buoyant, even as they mourn. We know who's dying. <laughs>